Okay, we're gonna stop. Okay, it's a little bit before five o'clock on Monday afternoon. Welcome to the Cucamonga Woodworking Zoom thing with Kevin Hayes, who never seems to be around. But um, I am Dennis Hayes, and this is Ed Rizzardi. And Ed Rizzardi, who the heck are you? I am a master woodworker. <laughs> I think everybody's heard this speech before. Well, in case we get, we get new people, right? Uh, how long have you been doing woodworking, Ed? 50 years. 50 years. Uh, not counting that when I started 12 years old at Upland Junior High School. Okay, we won't throw that in. But, uh, uh, why not? Uh, because if you saw what I made when I was 12 years old, you'd say, uh, don't quit your day job. <laughs> okay, it is being very hey, I did the same thing in high school and that, you know, in the shop classes. <laughs> I've been Gotta doing it more somewhere. than 50 years, too. <laughs> you ever make a boat out of a two-by-four? <laughs> no, I made two boats with two-by-fours. Oh, man, you got me. 13 years old, yep. I, put, I assumed that the frames had to be like framing on a house. So the frames were two by fours and they were 16 on center. <laughs> this thing was eight foot long. Oh. And yeah, I used uh, three sheets of plywood, one for the bottom, one sheet was both sides and another one for the partial deck. Oh. And hey, it worked. Hey. It worked fine. Oh, wait, I'm talking about a boat that was only like 12 inches long. That was Oh, no, I'm talking about <laughs> one that actually I oh, lost. Yeah. Oh, no, I you're took it down to the way. water. I took it down to the water on a little red wagon tied behind the bicycle. And we launched it with a five horsepower on it. It was nose heavy. That thing weighed a ton. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, for those of you who just joined us, this is the uh, Cookmonk Woodworking uh zoom thing i'm not really sure what to call it uh, and it was we'll the question and answer goob meeting okay yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm dennis hayes uh, kevin is my nephew uh ed and i we've been he's been doing it for 50 years and you're three years older than i am so i've been doing it for 47 years <laughs> uh thereabouts uh to, to kind of start off just welcome glad you're all here uh you know i'm i'm getting more used to running these zooms i didn't really uh and, and Joan is not, is off site right now, so I don't have him to help. So bear with me on the Zoom stuff. I am here on uh, Zoom. Remotely. You're on Zoom and that's all. Zoom in, Joan. So I think to start off with, uh, tell, them, uh, tell everybody a little bit about oh. San Diego. No, no, wait a minute. Tell them a little bit about San Diego. San Diego. San Diego Design and Wood Fair. Uh, I still haven't received word on anything. But I will turn that over to Ed. Um, first of all, they uh, canceled the award ceremony for good now. No, no awards. I, I, I won third and fourth place in the category that I entered in. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah. Uh, so that's about all we know right now. So. Yeah, and I, I have no idea. I'm kind of, uh, I'm just going to wait, I guess. I think Steve uh, Grezik is going to go down there on Wednesday and maybe he'll let me know, maybe not. Yeah. Uh, I'm not really uh, that concerned. Yeah. Uh, but we pick up our furniture from San Diego the sixth. on the 6th and then we deliver to the Ontario or to Orange, uh, Orange County on the following Friday on or the, the next Friday. No, two days later on the 8th. Is it 8th or? No. Uh, what? Anyway, the, next, yeah, the week, a couple days afterwards. Yeah. So. Um, now, I, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if Steve is going to be here today, but uh, last week we had a really great presentation by a good friend, Steve Grezik, and uh, Kevin did post the entire Zoom meeting on his uh, Cucamonga YouTube channel, but you have to go through 37 minutes. He didn't edit it at all. So to watch it, you have to skip forward, you know, 40 minutes or thereabouts to, to get to it. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about it, but I, I think maybe, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll give everybody a little chance to see it. I thought it was fantastic. Ed and I were talking a, a little bit about it. It was a, a master, class, master class in, I think, design and execution. Um, 
you know, it's a style that that we're familiar with with James Prenov. Uh, I think Ed, you're a little more familiar with Prenov. Yeah. You've you've made a piece, I think that. Yeah, you know, I've made several with uh, his influence. Yeah. Um, but I think he mainly did cabinets. Yeah. If I'm uh, not mistaken. I I don't think I've ever seen a chair made by uh, uh, Prenov. Yeah. Um, it was so good. I wish it would have been longer. <laughs> Part two. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was really outstanding, yeah. you know, but I, I just wish it would have been longer, you know, a little bit. Um, I don't know. It, it was good, but I wish it seemed like it went a little fast on some parts. And, you know, and I'm a little slow, so you know how that goes. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> join you. Uh, so again, those of you who haven't seen it, I would recommend you go to Cucamonga Woodworking dot live L I V E, and you can uh, uh, fast forward because it we're doing a little bit we're recording or because of my ineptitude I recorded the entire two hours, uh, but today we're only recording for five o'clock till when we end. So check that out. It's really good. Uh, Steve put together a fantastic um, video and very, uh, uh, I think, worthy of, of everybody watching it again. Uh, if you can't find it, I'll, I'll give you some other or give you some other options on how to, to check it out. Uh, to follow up a little bit with some stuff we talked about at the last one, uh, who you've got the maple tree that you're going to do some limbs, turn some limbs. I'm, I'm looking. Yeah. Right. That's, that was me. I had asked about um, trimming the tree and maybe saving some of the limbs to, uh, to do some turning. And uh, I just really want to know how long it would take to get that wood down to a level of dryness where I could do that. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to, to address that a little bit. My, uh, one of the things that I did professionally, uh, in addition to the woodworking, was uh, there is a, a science about drying things down. I was a, it's called uh, psychrometry, and it's actually uh, uh, the study of getting rid of moisture in building materials. Uh, I, that was the profession, the business that I was in. And it relates to dry down and dehumidification, et cetera. Uh, and I, I've got a couple of, you know, I've dried a lot of wood. Uh, and the, I think Steve mentioned, uh, you know, one inch or a, a year per inch of wood. That's the rule of thumb. Right. It really, it, and it's a great rule of thumb. It's something that you go by by default. But you have to take into consideration the, the species of wood, all sorts of different uh uh, you know, what are the properties, the density of the wood, the density, the humidity that's in the air that you have in yeah. your area, it right. all comes in, it takes effect with it. Yeah. And sometimes it takes longer in a dry climate. It takes less time. And to, to give, to kind of flesh it out a little bit, uh, I had some extraordinarily dense um, eucalyptus that was three inches thick. And I think it, it, it was, uh, blown over uh, three years before I got it. And then it sat in under 10% uh, percent humidity for two years. And when I cut into it, it was still about uh, 14%, uh, which I, I decided to go, I, I had something I wanted to make with it. Uh, uh, it was, I mentioned it before, it was from the uh, Los Angeles Arboretum. So I wanted to make something out of that tree to submit to a show that they put on. So I basically designed the piece where the moisture wouldn't really affect it. You want to shrank a little bit more when it dried, it wouldn't affect or break it up. You know, I, I thought it would be a safe bet. Uh, at the same time, I also got some three inch redwood that when I got it here uh, to the two or to the under 10% moisture, it was as dry as a bone almost when I got it. So it was two years. So in, if you have a moisture meter, I would highly recommend getting one. 
Uh, but on that smaller stuff, uh, hey, turn it and see, how, see what it works. Experiment with it. I'm sure you're going to have enough. And I'd really be curious to see what you think. Turning green wood is a practice that people have done for a long, long time. Making chairs out of green wood, historically, they, they do it all the time. And they use the shrinking component to actually tighten up the joints. So I just wanted to bring that up. All the rules, all the, 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 the uh, kind of the little uh, rules of thumb or thumb rule, whatever it's called, uh, uh, kind of take second seat or back seat to the reality of what you're going to do. Uh, can't hurt. It's free. And <laughs> turn it, turn, you know, get five or six, turn them a little bit, you know, at a time and see how it works. So we, we talked a little bit about that. Um, I have some information for Les also. Uh, okay. I was taught, we were talking about the kiln drying. There's a right. place in Farmingdale, 27 Grand Avenue. The guy who runs it, his name is Cameron. And uh, the way to get a hold of them is on Facebook. You go under Lumber Slabs. And that's how I got a hold of them. But they do kiln drying. You bring a piece in, they'll can kiln dry it for, for a fee, of course. But uh, it's the only one that I know of on the island. I'll look into that. Okay, now on that, on that, on that same note, um, you know, there are several different kinds of uh, dehumidification processes. And one of them, uh, well, you've probably heard of freeze dried, which I don't think is appropriate for the wood. Uh, but some of the uh, 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 arborists or like uh, uh, BC, I, I don't think he's got, he's got a, a kiln. But they also have kilns that can uh, create a vacuum. And if, if you dry your wood in a heated vacuum kiln, it'll it'll speed up the process almost by double. It depends on the how low you can get the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the pressure. So all different kinds of stuff. In fact, it'd be kind of fun to get a little vacuum pump and create a you do your own uh, small vacuum kiln. So if you do that, let me know. I'd be interested. It almost like sucks the moisture out of it. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it lowers the vapor pressure uh, and allows the vapor to get out of the wood uh, faster. Uh, we, we used to use we used to use uh, truck mounted desiccants. We could actually create an environment that's two percent humidity in a hundred thousand square foot building that had just suffered a complete flood. And we could actually dry buildings out so fast that we would damage the building if we did it yeah. as quickly as we could. So it was always, we had to kind of dance to keep the humidity at the right level. So it was taking out the moisture of the building materials without ruining all the wood. So that, that kind of fleshed that out a little bit, I hope. Any, any other, sure. anybody want to add to it? Air dried versus kiln dried. <laughs> Air dried is supposed to leave more of the colors of the wood in it. Is that true? As opposed uh, to the other? I, you know, we've been using kiln dried walnut forever. And I use, I've got lots of air dried walnut out there. And I really can't tell the difference. Uh, there, there's a lot of, uh, I think people kind of like the idea of, uh, air dried and not, you know, rushing it, but, uh, uh, you know, use what you got. I think the difference would have to be so subtle that I feel like you would have to take two of the same piece to really compare, like maybe book match something, but before you glue the two sides together, <laughs> kiln dry one, air dry the other. And then once they're both to the same density, then join them, finish them and see if there's any, any difference on either side. Yeah, and the only thing that I really, you know, the only, I don't demand too much of all this technical stuff other mm -hmm. than I want it to be 10% or less, period. Uh, and I, I can't find, Joan, do you have my uh, moisture meters? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, can't, I can't find them. I'll, I'll show them next time. And uh, I have a penetrating 
that you stab into the wood, and then I've got an electronic that uh, takes more of an average as what we, it's called a trimec, and that's what we used uh, at work in the old days, so. Well, real quick, I had the opportunity to go through Missouri Pacific Lumber, um, which is touted as the largest walnut lumber mill in the country. They said that they induce steam in the drying process, mm -hmm. uh, the kiln drying process, and that's what brings out that color, that deep brown color. But they didn't go elaborate. Uh, I mean, I did, didn't take class there on it, but we were just casual conversation. So <clears throat> I think it's more of a science than an art. And uh, um, I've always used kill drying lumber, yeah. uh, very little air dried lumber at all. Yeah, so. never, never. I mean, it's always been beautiful. The, yeah. the walnut that we get is from Indiana, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay. I guess Let's Google any, it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ed, you want to talk about that? Oh, uh, this week I had the opportunity or the luxury of uh, acquiring 10 board feet of hackberry. Never, never used it before. Um, this happens to be a cutoff piece from uh, the larger pieces that I have, but the, this represents um, pretty much what it looks like. Um, interesting grain pattern. Um, I don't know what it's going to look like finished yet, but the interesting part about it is uh, it machines very easily, uh, but it has long stringy fibers in it. And I noticed that when I was dovetailing it, that a lot of the dovetails had these little hair feather things left over from the dove, which walnut, I never had that before. So I did a little research on the internet and this wood is considered one of the best if you're gonna bend, use it for bending. Um, it primarily grows in the Northeast. That's why we don't have it here in Southern California. They say it's the most underrated uh, Hardwood, it's fairly heavy. I would say it's like the density of walnut, uh, but I didn't have any any problem machining it. Uh, ran it across the joiner, the planer, everything. No tear off. Um, I they say it's like a dollar something a board foot on the internet. I don't know if it's that cheap right now, but you know I think it'd be great for. You know, if you wanted to use it for a style of furniture that you wanted to make, or if you were looking for a good hardwood to make shop cabinets, they say it's for a lot of kitchen cabinets are made out of. But it's, it kind of has the characteristics of ash, and but it has a lot more um, coloration in it, of grain. So um, if you happen to see it in your neck of the woods and you want to experiment with it, I don't think it'd be a risk to buy some of it and play with it and make something out of it. It's uh, very stable. Kiln dried on the East Coast here. I It's about four fifty to $5 a board foot. Well, I didn't look oh. at the date on the internet thing that I read. I read a bunch of articles. It could be a dated, you know, I, I'm sorry. I yeah, didn't. okay, because yeah. Uh, it might even be shorts, but the lumber yeah. itself is, is okay. yeah, it's, it's about the same as cherry. Okay. Um, it's about 250, 290 here in Minnesota, but it's so common. Okay. Yeah, they said the trees grow uh, uh, 30, 40 inches in diameter, and some of them are like 100 feet tall or something like that. It was like remarkable. I mean, uh, but we're just not, I mean, I've never in my whole life seen this at any of the lumber yards in California. Yeah. There, I've never even heard of it until. The individual that sent me this was so nice <laughs> to uh, bring it to my attention. Uh, not mentioning any names. Not mentioning any names. So not, not a requirement. I have no idea why Michelle is laughing, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, before we get to the video, anybody uh, have anything you want to talk about for a minute or two? And then after the video, we'll leave it open. Oh, again. Uh, real quick, I have one thing for sale. I'm not going to, it's not for sale, but if anybody's interested in a Festool Domino machine, oh, yeah. there is a website right now called uh, Tool Pro uh, or Tool Nut, one of the two. But they're selling brand new Domino machines because they're overstocked and they got approval from Festool for $429. Now, it's not a huge savings. 
but generally there are no savings on Festool on anything, no matter where you go or where you look or what you get. Right now they're going for anywhere from $1,099 to $1,019. I don't know why the price variation, I think the 1099 come with two useless attachments that Dennis and I have never used. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you're not interested in the attachments, you can save yourself about $100 free freight. And depending on where you live, what state, I, we have, have to pay cap tax in California. But just FYI, um, don't know how long the sale is going to go on for. But somebody might say, hey, I've been looking and looking and looking. I can't find one. If you want to save 100 bucks? jump on it now. You're not going to ever do it again. That's all. Yeah, OK. They're, they're basically a fair trade item. Yeah. yeah, no matter where you go, it's the same price. Right, exactly. I mean, Rockler lost their franchise because one of their uh, offices was discounting the stuff and they got busted. That was about five or six years ago. Yeah, they finally got it back. So they're pretty tight on that. So the fellow didn't tell me how many of these units he has in inventory. He said, we're, we were overstocked. So just FYI, um, I've looked on eBay used ones are going for more than more than a new one. People are crazy on eBay right now. Just outrageous prices. So, okay. Take it away, Dennis. Okay. Um, you know, uh, last night I was saying, oh my goodness, what am I going to do for a video today? Um, and I know we've talked about the, for those of you who knew, I'm, I'm a, I make guitars also. Uh, that's my hobby. So, uh, <laughs> I said, okay, well, I'll, we'll, we'll start. Kevin's wanted to do a, a guitar thing. So uh, the video is kind of the uh, preliminary uh, overview of guitar making. And then as people request or want, I'll, I'll do individual videos on individual processes. But this is the... Uh, um, Kind of a, the overview, uh, maybe a little. Some of the areas get uh, get a little bit involved with, but it's basically just shows you what it's going to take. I decided many years ago that I wanted to make a guitar. Or actually, I said I want to make three guitars. That was my my goal, which forced me to make infrastructure for making multiples of stuff. If you just make one, you don't have to make all these uh, fixtures and stuff. But if you're going to you know, if you think you might want to make more than one, then it's worth making the fixtures. I've made about 50 guitars so far. Uh, I probably still have, if you look around the shop, I have uh, probably 10, uh, I don't know, dead ends, you might say, or just waiting to be put together. So without further ado, I'm going to share the screen, right, Joan? Yes. Okay, share the screen. And guitar part one. Okay, there we go. And I'm gonna move this guy over here. Now just, I, I make a note of this, but this guitar is actually made out of completely out of rescued wood from the Los Angeles Arboretum. You notice kind of a weird color. Uh, and I will, uh, uh, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. I will make it as, there we go. And then we're gonna start. It's about uh, 18 minutes. So hopefully we'll see you when it's over. <laughs> there is sound to it, but not right now. The first part of a series of videos we're gonna do on guitar making. Before we start, we're just gonna get kind of a basic anatomy of the guitar. We're gonna talk about the body, which is all the, the box, the sound box of the guitar, several components. The other component is the neck. The body consists of the top, sides, and the bottom, or the back, I call it. The bridge. Saddle, bridge pins, rosette, 
On the inside of the back, there is bracing. You can see one there. Underside of the top, there's bracing also. We'll talk about all of those in our other videos, but this is just an overview of the basic structure. We have the frets, the side of the fretboard. Sometimes we have binding, that's a little piece of wood from here to here. Sometimes we make them, sometimes we don't. The neck, the heel. The neck, the nut, the tuners or machines. Inside of the neck, we have a truss rod. Can't see it here. We'll throw that. Just check your connection before we started. Rose. Or is it just me? No, no it's frozen. <laughs> yeah, they totally didn't like check it before. <laughs> They're in freeze. <laughs> That's the D string right there, ladies and gentlemen. Dennis, I think you need to check your connection because it's coming in all choppy and I'm not getting any sound. Is it just me? No, it's not just you. No, it's just what you said. Choppy, no sound. <clears> hmm. <throat>
I text him to see if what's up, but I think he's trying to figure it out. I text him. He says his service is sure strong and his video is not frozen. Oh, wait, now it might be. Yeah, his video is frozen solid now. <laughs> he's moving on my end, but I can't hear him. Uh, I could, yeah, I could see him moving. The video is, uh, it looks like he's trying to straighten it out. Yeah, okay. He's going to uh, post it on his YouTube later. Hmm. Are you wearing a festal shirt, Joan? I am. <laughs> Hope they gave you that for free. How did you buy that? Oh, you know. I bought the tool and the shirt came with it, so I paid heavily for it. Yeah, that's the most expensive shirt in your uh, leave your competition in the dust. Right on. Dennis. <laughs> yes, so I have Dennis on the line. No one else can hear him. Can you guys hear him? No. Negative. Yeah, no one can hear you. So shows I'm that he's not muted, so it's got to be a microphone issue. He's checking his microphone. We need Kevin back. Yeah, he doesn't know what's going on. It was working fine. It shows full strength. So he's going to upload some of this stuff after. Fair enough. Yeah, I thought Kevin was supposed to be here this weekend or this week. He said he's still working. <laughs> I mean, okay. it's his internet connection. So I don't think we can blame Kevin, but he's just going to blame Kevin. <laughs> Kevin would know how to fix it. He's got like a PhD yeah. and like he drove nuclear submarines and shit. Exactly. If Kevin were here, we wouldn't be having these issues. So, so um, Dennis doesn't know what else to do. His sincerest apologies for today's program. Hey. Try rebooting the laptop. That always works. Oh, there's a suggestion, Dennis. Maybe try rebooting your laptop and. Mm -hmm. I'll probably shut down the meeting. He's going to shut down the meeting and restart it. Okay. He can hear us. <laughs> he can still hear you. I've got an idea, Joan. What's your oh, idea? Um, way back, I made a set of Windsor chairs, you know, the hoop back chair for my kitchen. I was not able to sculpt it. All I was able to do was scoop out a little bit with a scorp, and uh, that was it for the seat. How about uh, showing us how to sculpt 
the seat of a chair. Oh, right now? No, not right now. I mean, for the <laughs> <for> future. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ah, don't you have a chair back there somewhere, <laughs> Joe? You could just sculpt in your room right there. That would have been nice. I was going to say, I don't have uh, one on me. But yes, definitely in the future. How did that? For that. How did that rocker turn out, Joan? Oh, I'm not done with this rocker. I got sidetracked with some other projects because, you know, that one wasn't a commission. But um, it's coming along great. I stopped at the point where I need to actually do the bent lamination on the rockers and then start assembling everything. And I've got that eucalyptus. So that's actually the perfect project to go over um, carving with. So that'll be it. Quick question. What was the name of that wood? I missed it. Eucalyptus. No, no, the one that Ed was holding up. Oh, Ed, what was the name of that Hackberry. wood? Hackberry. What is it? Hackberry. It's Hackberry. 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 Blackberry, like. No, no, no. Hack. Oh, hack. H A. Hack. H -A like, yeah. Like you hack a computer, right? Hackberry. Hackberry. Yeah. You like hack a band off with an axe. Mm hmm. <laughs> Definitely never heard of that. That probably makes more sense than my computer one. I, I love working with it. It is incredibly beautiful. $250 so a board foot is a beautiful price, man. Will this meeting end when uh, Dennis restarts the computer? Is that what's going to happen? I, 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 don't <laughs> I think know. we're going to get cut off. Yeah. Yeah. Or we're going to like hover in the ether for like a minute or two. <laughs> Well, I have a question. Um, what do you, does anybody have one of those uh, dust collectors that hangs on the wall? Yeah, I do. How do you, how do you like it? I love it. It works perfect. It's only a four inch, but it works for every tool in my shop. What brand did you get? You know, uh, Rock, Rockler, I got it from Rockler. Was it the Rockler? Brand? I think it's a Rockwell. Oh, Rockwell. Okay. Yeah, okay. Rockwell. Yeah. Because I, I was thinking about getting one because I got such a small shop. Yeah. I've got a bigger one, but I need another one for, you know, to go with my new jointer. Uh huh. Yeah, well, I use it on my jointer, my planers, everything. I have to disconnect the hose, of course, and put right. it inside them because I don't have the room. So, and I move a lot of machinery around all the time. But I, I it got works fine. I actually have two of them that I bought years and years ago, um, a long time ago. They're built by craftsmen. And I have one under my jointer and one that's hooked up to my planer. And um, using the tools like that with um, the vacuum one for each works very, very well. All and you right, know awesome. what else what else you might want to look into is a cyclone put put out by Oneida or Onida or something like yeah. that. I have the four inch cyclone and that thing I don't even get dust blowing out outside because I have a vent that goes, uh, out through the wall and outside. I don't even have any dust that blows through. That cyclone traps everything. I'm gonna make one. <laughs> I, I, I have. Made I made mine. I bastardized like a jet vac that broke, and like cut it out, and then like cut out a metal trash can. So now my shop vac connects to my metal trash can, and then it connects to the hose that I use to actually suck things up in and so i haven't emptied out my shop vac in like years it's like i checked it the other day and it was like two inches of dust on the bottom of it and i've emptied out the trash can like a billion times they do work i believe um i don't know if rockler's still selling them but um, um they have the they have the fittings that go on top so if you have a barrel um with a lid that can be sealed you, you can buy those fittings from rockler can you hear me yep can you hear? Hey, uh, you're yeah. back. there you go 
Okay, we're back. Yeah, yeah you back. missed the whole you missed the whole program. No. <laughs> so I, I transferred it to Joe. Joe is now the host. Hello, oh. welcome to my show. <laughs> Can I jump in here on your dust collector stuff? Um, think about a dust collector. What is it? It's a motor with an impeller in it. That's all it is. It goes around and around. So Wait, don't get hung don't up on, with the bag attached. With a bag attached. Thank you. <laughs> Make sure you got the bag attached. But don't get hung up on these brands and everything. Look at the, the cubic feet per minute that the dust collector is pulling. Now, the one Michelle's talking about is 650 CFM is what it's referred to. There's a whole bunch of them on the market. It's either 650 CFM, probably 1,200, 1,800. They go up in increments of about like maybe 600 feet CFM apart. But, you know, you can go to Harbor Freight and buy one for about 300 bucks. That's 1,800 CFM. It's got two big bags on it. It's a motor with a blower on it. It's a big vacuum cleaner is all it is. Now, all these other companies got features with, you know, HEPA filters and mumbo jumbo and sweeping mechanisms that clean off. That all costs money if all you're looking for. But the one you're looking that's at, Michelle, amazing. would be great. I've got one, a jet one that's like that. No, you just hang up. and It you works fine for my Agazani band saw, my radial arm saw. It's 650 it's, no, CFM. No, it's it's great. Don't try to hook that up to a big dual drum sanding okay. machine. Hang it up. won't Bye. work. It doesn't have enough cubic feet per minute of suction time. So the real thing you want to look at is what you're going to use it for the tool. What are you going to use it on? If you're going to use it on a little scroll saw. It'll suck the blade off your scroll saw. Okay. <laughs> you don't need one that's 2400 CFM. I need one for the dual drum sanding machine that's that big. Otherwise, I've got dust coming out all over the place. So also, uh, also go to the internet. They have a uh, site that gives you basically the CFM that you need to operate with a certain machine. Right. And they, exactly. it's very, it's all on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't everything? But Mo Rockler has that one you're looking at right now on sale for like 345 bucks, which is a good price because the jet, they're like six, 700 bucks now. So again, a motor, impeller, and a bag, that's all. I have a friend that bought the ones at Harbor Freight and he gutted them because he's working down doing tunnel boring. And he's been running those motors down in tunnels for like five years and none of them have crapped out. So don't get hung up on, oh, it's gotta be a, a lagoon or they're all coming out of the same factory in China. Okay, let's be honest. I, I would jump onto one thing that Ed just said. Um, I don't know if I'm disagreeing with you or not, but it also depends kind of what you said on using drum, drum sanders versus like a table saw or a joiner. Right. Where you're bringing those like big chips come flying off. You don't really need to worry too much about what the 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 microns, the level of the filtration that it is. Right. If you're using a sander, for God's sakes, yeah, I would say that's a really important thing. Because I used, I had one that didn't have very fine filtration, and there was I could see crap blowing all over the place. Oh, yeah. It was going yeah. straight out the filter. Right. So I would add that in there. Yep. Not uh, only that, look for a used one. I paid one hundred and ten dollars for a Rockler hangs on the wall. Right. And you find them on Facebook or one of the other sites. Craigslist or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Craigslist. Yep. But. Again, it's just a motor and an impeller and a bag. And 110 volt motors now, I mean, fans have them. They, they, you run a fan all day, they run forever. They're just almost bulletproof. So the only thing about the bag versus a canister, a little more messy, that's all. It, it's no big deal. I'm used to the sawdust. I, I hate these people that are hung up on like half a micron or something like that, it, fine. I've been sucking sawdust all my life. It's no big deal. So, but, uh, it, you know. So far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> but you could buy three or four of those ones that you're talking about at Rockler and position them around your shop. And you'd probably have the whole thing like, okay. I, I have all my vacuums on Alexa, which is really yeah, handy. Alexa, turn on the vacuum. <laughs> really? Yeah, she just she just asked. Wow. Yeah, I said, turn on drum back. Wow. 
there it goes. Alexa, turn is, off, drum back. Is that the epitome of laziness? No. Oh, uh, I'm not because she doesn't I'm listen really very good sometimes. So sometimes it's more work than just flicking a switch. She she listens, oh, laziness she is the mother of invention. You think. Typical woman. No, oh, come on. She, she <laughs> listens to more than you think. Yeah, uh, they hear everything. You know, you can say something. Yeah, but it stops and right. It goes right here and then it just stops. <laughs> I think don't tell you something. Once in the a while, epitome, you know. Okay. Oh, wait, okay. Oh, yeah, well, let's talk woodwork. <laughs> no, the the epitome of laziness with the with the um, the dust collectors is yeah. you can get a vibration sensor that you put on a saw, or on your your motor rather, so yeah. that when you turn on your whatever it is you're using, if it's all hooked up to a system. Or an individual, and like Ed was talking about, you turn on the motor, the vibrate, the, mo the sensor oh, senses you. the vibration on the motor, turns on the dust collector. So you don't even have to talk to Alexa. Yeah, you, you know, I have this little electrical, I have this little electric box that you plug into your um, outlet, and you plug one yes. uh, from the dust collector and the other from the like my radial arm, and I have a small vac for that. You don't need very much, especially if you have a chute right behind. You know where the where the chips come off with, from the saw, and as soon as you hit the um, the button, that suction comes on and remains on for about maybe fifteen seconds after the um, radial arm goes off. Well, I had a couple of those. I fried one of them. You got to be careful about the amperage. Yeah, I had it on a yeah. festival chop saw and a shop vac, and I literally fried. Fortunately, my surge protector. Hmm. I, I, so the amperage was too high. You'll pop a circuit breaker or something. Most of them are 15 amp because most homes don't have 20 amp, 110 circuits. Uh, that's, but uh, they do make 220, but again, amperage. So just be careful about the amperage, that's all. Yeah, I have uh, my, all the man saws hooked up to an auto on best tool. My chop saw is an auto on, so far so good. Mm -hmm. uh, only way to fly. Yeah. Fly. Looks like we lost Joe. I guess that maybe it's a Zoom. Maybe, maybe it is Kevin's fault that he doesn't have the high enough. He's not paying enough money for the Zoom uh, the bandwidth. Bandwidth, yeah. <laughs> and you, you know, I mean, it's working fine now. Uh, well, hey, while I've got you, and I'll kind of, I don't know why Joe. Uh, I, I guess he said that uh, maybe his girlfriend showed him. No, he, his, his, I don't know. <laughs> he, he said his computer locked up. Oh. I will, I will post the video that I was showing. Uh, soon after the meeting, it will be on my uh, YouTube channel. You just go on uh, YouTube, Dennis Hayes, H-A-Y-S, and you can watch the video. It won't have any of the Zoom stuff. And then uh, we'll see what we can salvage from the, the meeting for Kevin to put on Zoom. Um, what, what, what time? Yeah, see, we still got uh, Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's working, right? It yeah. Worked. Yes. And now that we have Steve, Steve, we, uh, do you have any comments on your uh, the presentation you did um, last week? And maybe I should start by saying you can go on Kevin's YouTube channel and watch it, but he has the entire meeting on it, and you have to go. I watched it on yours. Yeah, you have to <laughs> you have to go to like forty minutes before we get to your video. So. Uh, Oh, so the entire is the entire video on now? The entire video okay, great. is on Kevin's, but it's two hours. Wow. <laughs> you know, so yeah, we're 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 a chatty group. Uh, but I, I'm putting on my YouTube channel just as a default because I, you know, it takes Kevin a while to do all the stuff he's got to do to get it to, on. So any any comments you want to say about your video that you did last week? I um looking at it from you know uh, on my end over here and I sent it out to so you know my wife actually sent it out to friends and family and something everybody's just a impressed with what I did and that's for me but they were they were impressed with they were impressed with the fact that what it was that they, something like this existed yeah um and some of them are woodworking friends who didn't know this was around so well uh, we'll see if any of them start showing up okay and and just just so you know it really annoys me I mean we've had what 10 meetings uh and what 90 percent have been fine and then this glitch today i will get it resolved and hopefully we'll make it bulletproof uh, and continue i will be having a, 
I was hoping to go through this video and then you guys tell me what you would like me to do a video, a thorough video on a component of a guitar. Uh, I'm sure you all know enough about guitars where you can say, hey, how do you do this or that? Watch the video on the YouTube, either Kevin's or mine. And then next week we can talk about uh, what you want me to, or I think I might do a rosette, how I, the complete process of doing a rosette because it's, it's simple, it's kind of cool. And, uh, you know, I, I need to do that on one of my guitars, so. Uh, I'd be interested in seeing that. Yeah, it, it's really crazy. I have, everything is homemade. Uh, so that that's, uh, unless I hear something else, that's probably what I'll be doing. That sounds good to me. Okay. Again, we're not, we're not, we're not done. I mean, continue. Uh, uh, can I ask Steve a question from last week? Sure. <clears throat> I was so impressed on how you use those nuts, you know, to make the, um, well, what you used them on like the door and stuff. The, you know, you said you had to take the glue and you saturated them like three times. Is that? The beetle nut. Yeah. Yeah, the beetle nut, right. So the, the, the dark part of the beetle nut is very, very fragile. It's like, it's not as solid or stable as paper. So the white parts will actually split. And I had that problem a few times when I was running it through a, um, uh, a scroll saw, because that's what I was using, because my fingers are pretty close to it. And I figured that a scroll saw hits my finger, it's this, the blade's going to break, not my finger. Um, <laughs> Famous last but, one. <laughs> yeah, just, just a flesh wound. Right? My something minor. Um, and it wasn't, and I had a foot pedal for it. So anyway, uh, I've hit my point, finger with a scroll saw. I live to tell about it. Yeah, um, the my, the point you're getting at is each one of those little br dark brownish um, lines is very very fragile. It's a weak point in the structure. As a nut, it's fine, but when you start taking stuff off, now you're ex I guess, uh, uh, compromising the weak points even more. So I got that ultra thin, um, I, I just happen to have here, I used a uh, Mercury Adhesives MX100 XF. That's it. Um, I'm not saying that's the greatest stuff in the world. Um, these, these people come highly recommend. I get it at uh, the local um, Woodcraft. Uh, apparently that, and there's another one like it that are both are really thin, like water. So they'll saturate in, whereas most CAs stay on the surface for the most part. Um, they'll go in a little bit, but this stuff just sucks in really quickly. Um, and and that, that helped out, out a lot. And I've used that, that same material to help draw um, thicker uh, uh, CAs into position, uh, like a medium or something where it just starts pulling in. So the capillary action uh, works to your benefit on that. Um, okay. I've, this is the first bottle I've had, and I'm like seriously impressed with it. Um, do you cut digital. them in half to start to make your, or you soak them in the glue, right? No, no. I, I, I sit there and pray a lot to the woodworking gods um, <laughs> as we're cutting them up, um, and you know some of them explode. You can glue them back together. You know, it's like so what. Uh, as long as you can find the pieces and they're not flying all over. Um, but yeah, I run them through the bandsaw um, either by hand or with a, a teeny tiny jig. And if you've seen a, um, a jig to be a circle cutting jig. Uh, so basically it's a, a post and you drill a hole in whatever it is you're doing and you run it in a bandsaw into a certain spot stops and you spin it around and it cuts a circle. Well, I always use, I wanted something that's square. So I, basically took that same uh, technology, hot glued the piece of, of betel nut to it, ran it through the saw, backed the thing out, pulled the hot glue off with uh, alcohol, rotated it 90 degrees, held it in place, glued it back down, and kept on doing that four times for, well, yeah, four times for each um, of the handles, the, the knobs on the door. Um, the, uh, the, door drawer pulls the real thin like wafer kind of sections that was i got them as reasonably close as i could um 
flattened out one side on a um, just a, a sanding block by hand. Just took my finger, ran it back and forth until I get it flat. I'm where as where it's at. You can either flip it around and do the other side, which um, if you're careful, I guess, or it doesn't really matter. If it's parallel, you could do that. I happen to use a drum sander because I have one. Um, I did that. Um, the, the, the belt pretty much needed to be replaced. I ran it through anyway. Glad thing, good thing I did because that just gummed up. It's kind of soft material, gummed up that, that belt. And that's totally useless. So um, I'm going to be keeping, you know, belts around that I normally wouldn't use just for that, for purposes like that, if I, I don't worry about trashing a new uh, belt. But that, then I had a, a good given thickness for those. Um, the squares, uh, the, for the plugs, those um, I used a, uh, a sanding block, um, 80 grit and 100 grit and get them really, really close. To that. And I'm picking them up and constantly, I cut them on, the, on the, the, uh, the scroll saw, get them close, and then basically using that as a joiner planer, flipping it around, being very patient, using a small square. Uh, is it square? Good, fine. And just keep on going round and round and round until I get it where I want it. Um, oh. And then I used a, uh, um, uh, Exacto makes a mini, um, uh, miter box. I used that and I took the, the, cur the, uh, the set out of a uh, hacksaw blade and it fits right in there and I used that to cut them to length. Well, how did you connect them? I mean, is do you put a screw to connect the, the poles or how? Do okay, you three, three different, I, I get your point, three different things. So the plugs are just, that's, that's a mortise. So I used a square. So I just basically get it to fit, drive that in. That's easy. The um, the knobs, so that that I you know basically did turn, put in, turn around to ninety degrees, hot glue that process. What I did first was I I used half a nut because of the size, and I took it to the drill press. Um, I have some small uh, hand screw clamps, those wooden ones, like Uncle Fester used to put on his head for headaches. Um, put it in there drill the hole to the size of a brass screw that I happen to have. Um, and then glued that in place into the nut and use that as the center point to, to spin around to make the other, to, to make all four sides. So that's my reference point. So I drilled the hole in that jig exactly the same size as the, the thread, outer threads on that screw. Brass is great because you can you know, fashion, fashion it by, or fashion it uh, by hand very easily, cut it um, as opposed to metal screws. I didn't want to use a, um, uh, a wooden dowel, I guess you could, but I just wanted something that was going to be solid, so more, more solid, you know, piece of brass, solid, aluminum would be fine, I guess. I like the, just the thread of uh, a, a brass screw because it gives something for the glue to adhere into between the the, uh, the threads and bond to the wood. I have to uh, do a video on that. <laughs> the beetle nut no, that I could. had that I turned into knobs. What I did was use epoxy to soak into it. That's the uh, wood saturating epoxy. Yeah, same and same. yeah, what I would uh, do is take it and hot glue it to a a blank piece of wood, and I'd put it on a lathe. And I would round off the back, the hard shell on the beetle nut, and then I would cut it in half. And now they're beautiful draw poles. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I've used that same epoxy you're talking about for rot fix is one of them. Yeah, that stuff's fantastic too. I use that all the time. Yeah. Well, all gone. we made it almost. Uh, I'm, I'm toying with the idea of doing the video again. Uh, I know a lot of people might have to go. I don't know what the, uh, I'm just kind of curious if it was just the internet glitch because it, it works fine now. Uh, so how about this? How about we, you know, we the meeting will call it over, but I'm going to go ahead and start the video again. If you want to stick around and see if it works, uh, we'll give it a try. Okay. Is that okay?
Yeah. yeah. So Unless also besides Hackberry, look up uh, try Mulberry. Mulberry's got yeah. a lot of different color colors. Yeah. It's also uh, we live right down the street from that place, Mulberry. Mulberry, Mulberry. <laughs> yeah, all all the woods are interesting to use. Uh, it's just you know I guess we've we've been kind of in a rut, haven't we? Just using walnut. No. 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 <laughs> no. A walnut, eucalyptus, you can't cherry. improve on perfection. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it's so sweet. Okay, hey, thank you everybody for being patient. Uh, I'll uh, see if I can talk to Kevin about getting his. Uh, we'll, we'll blame him. The mm -hmm. uh, go to the next chair on Zoom. Okay, it, hopefully that's all it is. Uh, I doubt it, but I am going to start the video again. First of all, we're going to get it started. Okay, there it is. And then I'm going to share my screen. And here we go again. And hey, thank you guys for uh, showing up and we'll see at the end if it works. Here we go. It's pretty weird. It didn't. <coughs> first part of a series of videos we're going to do on guitar making. Before we start, we're just going to get kind of a basic anatomy of a guitar. We're going to talk about the body. It's all the, the box, the sound box of the guitar, several components. The other component is the neck. The body consists of the top, sides, in the bottom or the back, I call it, the bridge, the saddle, ridge pins, rosette. On the inside of the back, there is bracing. You can see one there. And on the underside of the top, there's bracing also. We'll talk about all of those in other videos, but this is just an overview of the basic structure. Uh, we have the frets, the, the side of the fretboard. Sometimes we have binding, that's a little piece of wood from here to here. Sometimes we make them, sometimes we don't. We have the neck, the heel. The neck, the nut, the tuners or machines. Inside of the neck, we have a truss rod. Can't see it here. We'll go through all that. The truss rod cover. This part from the nut back is the peg head. And then there is a peg head veneer that goes on top of that. A quick anatomy of a guitar. No, this particular guitar is not my usual. This is made from Metasequoia top, liquid ambar, sides and back. And the liquid ambar neck with apricot fretboard and apricot peg head veneer. And I believe we have an apricot. And it looks like walnut, walnut bridge. That is a quick overview of the anatomy. This is a normal Six string guitar. What we have here is an overview of all of the fixtures that I've made. Now, all these you can buy them at a store or a Sumac or one of those. But I, when I decided to make guitars several years ago, I wanted to make 
everything that I could. The only thing I don't make are the, the tuners, there they are, the tuners, the bridge or the saddle and the nut, and a couple of other items. I, the first 10 I made, I didn't use any store bought fixtures, but I did finally uh, get a, a couple of pieces. This guy right here is, uh, we'll, we'll go through them all individually, but uh, this, this drills the hole in the peg head for the tuner. I did it before just with regular drills. All of the stuff that we need. Said, I'm going to go over each one of these guys and get this in the case of a guitar body. I always think of the guitar body, the guitar neck, the major components, and then each one of those has its own little workflow. When I first started making guitars, I had didn't have the, the Agazzani. I had the uh, what, six and a quarter by uh, ten and a quarter Inca bandsaw, and I did not have uh, and of course my couple of table saws, drill press. I did not have the drum sander when I first started. I got this about a couple of years after I'd done it making guitars and it turned out it was really made things so convenient to make the, uh, the tops and the backs and the sides. Before I would simply just cut them as thin as I could on the little bandsaw and glue them together. Okay, came back. I forgot to put the, the plate blew up fixture. I've done a video on this before. And like I said, we'll go through all these pieces one at a time. I decided to make a guitar and it took me a month to come up with design profile or the shape that I want. It's not a copy of any guitar. It is a, a some of the best measurements of some of the best guitars. I came up with the Top template, and that's where it all starts right there. We'll start with the top template. This was a compilation of several uh, guitars from the past. I took uh, averages and several other dimensions. So, for point of reference, this is the upper valve. It's upper bout, the waist, and the uh, uh, lower bout. Uh, I think what was important for me was to kind of figure the, the ratios of the length of the body uh, to the max, the biggest diameter of the lower bout, the relationship of the waist measurement to the uh, lower bout, and also the uh, relationship to the uh, upper bow. So I came up with this design and it's it, it is the basis for um, uh, probably 60% uh, of the guitars that I make. I make two sizes. If you notice on the first one that I did, the front and the back have a straight line component uh, that's for gluing on uh, or make ease of uh, gluing on the uh, front and back blocks but i wanted to make a little bit bigger one with a rounded lower bout so you can see this is almost a, a nice radius all the way around it just adds another step to the making of the rear block which is not a problem at all now i also this does have a real Right here where the front block goes, this is where the neck attaches to the body. It is a, a flat. You can see it's just 
marginally different. That's about lined up. So it was five eighths or half inch bigger with the the curve. Eventually, I'll show you a couple of guitars made from each template. And it's amazing, but it is there is a lot of difference just in a small amount. They both sound good. The bigger one has a little bit more of a, a base, a little base responsibility. Now. There's a couple of different ways to bend the sides of the guitar, but I like to do it in, in this manner where you you actually form the sides and you use this in the bending form. Uh, the sides are about uh, 40 to 60 thousandths and they bend without heat. Uh, I sometimes I do spray it a little bit with water. This is for the walnut. Um, I don't use anything but walnut. I'm sure with the harder woods, uh, rosewood or something of that nature, you probably have to heat it up. Not opposed to doing it, but uh, I, I really like making the walnut sides and back guitars. And this is the exact profile of the, the smaller version. And I, I've modified the sides for the clamping. We look, this is the back of the guitar. And uh, the part laying on the uh, table is the front. Now, the, there is a 90 degree angle from the, the top right here to right here. And you're gluing it up. On the back, it's less than because the back actually slopes down. If you can see it, but there's actually a, a, a it's taller in the back. It's a little bit taller in the back and a little shorter in the front. This is the fixture that I use to glue up the, the front or the, the top and the back uh, plates. Uh, the top is usually redwood. I've made uh, spruce and others, but uh, I prefer wall or uh, I prefer redwood top guitars with the walnuts back and sides. In a walnut neck, but this is a picture that I use. I've, I've done a demonstration on this before, uh, and in the series, uh, I'll go ahead and do a, a uh, make a, a top and a back and video of that. But this is the picture that I use to make those. And here is another shop made component. This is what I use for gluing the braces to the back and braces to the top. An important Part of the guitar is the, the top has a 400 or my top, the tops that I make have a 480 inch radius uh, arc. And if you, I don't know if you can, this is the uh, fixture that I, or the template that I made is very slight. You can see that there's a real slight concavity. I've made each one of these just strike, made like eight long pieces and then uh, cut them in half and put them in, together in this and it works really great. So the top is 480 inch radius and then the back is 144. Same, you know, and it's quite a bit more of an art. It's important because it allows the, the top and the backs to expand and contract a little bit without breaking. Again, we'll show you. And then it's, it's a, a call, I, I'm not sure the name of go bar uh, clamp or fixture. And basically, I use uh, dowels. Uh, I'll put the plate, the top plate down, a brace, get them all lined up with glue on it, and then uh, use this as the, the, the clamp. And you can see up here. And then it, and it puts a, 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 a light but adequate amount of uh, pressure. You know, I'll have about uh, 10 of these uh, 
you know, I blew up uh, two or three braces with this uh, with these dowels using as a clamp mechanism. It works really well. Uh, every guitar I've made, I've used this system. Uh, an example of body. And we'll talk about the rosette. Okay, since we're here, I make all the rosettes. And there's some method or other like this. And I cut them very thinly with uh, the bandsaw. And how I make the dado into the top is I use this fixture right here. Let me take it over. Okay, this is the fixture that I use for cutting the rosettes. And you'll see there's two dowel pivots right here, and then one right here. You can see where there's, I've got the lines and another dowel. Well, this guy was, uh, I made it and I made it like this so I could adjust it uh, very uh, finely. And this actually cuts the rosette and it creates the dado. Uh, these guys right here, if I pin it, uh, put this in the top, this will cut the perfect dado around the, uh, the top. And then uh, I'll put it on this guy on this hole and it'll cut the outside of the rosette. And then I put it on and th this dowel right here, right here, and it'll cut the inside or vice versa. And it seems kind of impossible to do, but uh, depending on your how careful you are, you can cut cut them near near perfect. And you can see uh, I don't really see any negative parts. I don't see any places where it's, it uh, didn't work all that well. This guy right here is the uh, that'll be covered by the fretboard. Inside of the top are braced, and here's one of the, the templates that I use for a, a top brace there. This is about twice as big as it will be reduced in weight and size and made fairly nice. Now this is one of a cross brace. There's lots of different ways to brace a guitar top, but the way I do it uh, on these is the uh, cross brace like this. And there's other braces. We'll we'll go through all that in a, another video. In the back, and I use the same template for the tops and the back. And the backs have a little bit different bracing strategy where these braces go across like that. And if you notice, there is that uh, in the back that uh, one, 144 radius on these. You can see it rocks. I think it's pretty important to, for the uh, the radiuses for the resonation of the guitar. That's why I go to the time and trouble to do it. Since this is an overview, we're just going to show on the inside. You can see the the back braces configuration. I'll do another video on uh, each one of these components more in depth. But there's lots going on in here. You can see the uh, perfing on the sides. And there's, there's block blocking. And let's see if we can get in there and look at it. So you can see the, the front block. I think that's it. I'll share. Okay. Well, hey, thank you guys for sticking around. Uh, it was great. It, it seemed to me a little bit, a little bit too long, <laughs> but maybe I'm just getting tired. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, okay. Did it did it work correctly the whole time? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. All right. I think what I'm going to do, I'll I'll do the uh, I'll do a rosette for the the next time. I don't know 
if we get if we can get somebody else to do something that'd be great but uh i'll have a rosette one ready for when we need it okay on that note cool. let's go home thank okay? you thank you thank you, thank you very much take care have a good one all right take yeah. care guys bye 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 Hey, right. Dennis, I'm headed over to uh, San Diego on Thursday. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, let me know uh, if, if uh, any awards. <laughs> yeah, I'll take pictures and send them to uh, shoot them off to you and uh, Ed if you uh, yeah. let Ed, you know what's going on. Ed called uh, Ed uh, Glass, Gladney. Yeah. And Ed got a fourth and a, a, a third and a fourth. Okay. So uh, be interesting to see what got first and second in the kids. Yeah, I'll I'll try to see that because that's been an issue in the past. Yeah. All right. Have a good one. Okay. Take care, people. Bye. Joe, come by. All right. All right. Thanks. That's it. That's it. Okay, how do I stop this? Oh, there it is. It's hidden. Bye.